Welcome everyone. Uh, we are now update and I'm actually pretty excited about this one. I have questions galore for our guest today. So see if I can get my go to oh, that's right. Lori, you want to take us to the next screen? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm like trying to move the PowerPoint is not going. Um, first of all, thank you guys for being here. Um, we're working on doing this. It's your participation. We're hoping to provide the best value for your time on that. To that end, we'll keep moving here. Go ahead, Laura. Um, there's our agenda here. Yeah. Ryan, are you on here? I don't think Ryan's joining us today. So this, you're getting the summer second string crew here today. So I'm gonna give a little update. And then we're going to kick over to Mark, and Mark's going to give us a little bit of a, a little bit of floor covering training and discussion. And very much looking forward to this. So but I'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, we move through. I do want to say thank you to our sponsor. Oh yes, disclaimer first. Sorry, got to satisfy the lawyers. <laughs> we're not giving legal advice. We're not giving recommendations on finances and all that. We may give some recommendations on flooring at this point, but that's a different issue. So. But again, make sure you're checking out with your own people, your own attorneys, and, and go from there. So uh, we are here. I love the promote, protect, and educate. Um, folks, I'm going to tell you a little bit ahead of time with the, the log jam we're dealing with in, in the legislative side. Protection is a little easier on one side, but man, I'll tell you, it's rolling downhill at the state and local level. You've got to pay attention. That's where us protecting, working out, looking out for our own industry is, is all it takes. That we're the only ones there. So, so that. There we go. There's what I was looking for. My Home Depot Pro. Thank you, Home Depot. Thank you. Um, in so many ways, if you guys have not paid attention to some of the deals and discounts, you are missing out. And thank you also for those little uh, rebates and such. Those are nice and handy. Love to have those come in. So, all right. So, Kick on from here, Lori. Let's see. I think should be to. Oh, sorry, you're stuck with me at this moment. So, um, actually, was touching base with our lobbyist up in D.C., and he's like, "I, I, you can't, I can't make this up. Mansion just blew up another reconciliation. Things are all I thought there was progress to be made. And I'm like, that's fine. You guys having a logjam is not a problem for the rest of us right now." I'm not sure you're really fixing anything, so we'll leave it at that. But uh, double check my even my email notes here. Um, there's two things that are moving. One is a slim down chip maker incentive bill. Um, why am I mentioning this? Well, if you remember back in about beginning of 2018, we gave a little article that talked about when you're looking at opportunity zones or looking at buying, remember companies are reshoring as they call it, bringing manufacturing back to the US. What that means is areas that have manufacturing or zone commercial will have those secondary and tertiary areas that may become valuable again. So if you have options that you can buy those kind of properties for, that's a great option. If you have any ear of a governor, mayor, something like that, and they know that they're working on some chip maker deals coming in, those can be huge deals. And those deals are going to have, whether you want to call them coattails or effect, out into your secondary and tertiary markets where they're going to need residents, they're going to need places to live, they're going to need other businesses. So those are all valuable assets that are going to continue on. So seeing this chip maker bill incentive come through is a good thing because that's going to reshore a lot of those chips. Again, we can talk about digital stuff and the, you know, the, the vehicles that are sitting aside, but from our perspective for real estate investment, keeping an eye out on those properties is going to be key. Um, the other thing I want to mention is, oh, fly-in. So September 20th and 21st, we have a, yes, George, chip makers. People who are make chips, Intel, those kind of companies. That's what that's what I'm referring to. So sorry if that wasn't clear. Um, but Seller Finance Coalition is actually going to do a fly-in in September, and it's September 20th, starting at 1 p.m. until September 21st at 5 p.m. And this will be a fly-in to um, 
discuss HR 5013, which is the Affordable Home Ownership Access Act, which is an expansion of the bill that we had initially supported, which would take uh, the ability to sell our own property and sell or finance it, imagine that, and expand it from three in a rolling 12 month period up to about 24. And there's actually some different stages that it would actually impact as well. So whether you're under 200,000 and over it, but also do some tracking on it so we can find out how many solar financed, you know, buildings and, and projects there are. It's one of the things we just don't know, but that will also help for information as well. So that is moving forward. If you're interested in participating in that, let us know, reach out to myself, Charles at nationalria.org, um, or you can reach out to the, the coalition, the solar finance coalition. They've got their website up as well, but just reach out to me if you have any questions or want to participate. There's not a hotel specific, so find a good deal, find something that's reasonable if you'd like to come. Um, don't think this is a, this is not a national RIA event. We are going to participate with seller finance. Um, I'll be there. We'll go up and support this and kind of as we do. And one of the first steps, if you don't think you can make it, please go check out our voter voice site on the Action, Action Center and make sure you're at least emailed your congressman to participate and be a co-sponsor of HR 5013. So two other things I want to mention real quick is there's some hope for those of you who are paying um, insurance for flood. This could be a hopefully an actual re renovation of the pro program, a complete redo of the program. That's going to be huge. Um, and it's Senate banking is discussing this. They're working on basically kind of a, a, a risk rating 2.0, which will change how uh, flood insurance is actually calculated. And I can tell you, just a property I had bought last year, the flood insurance on it was going to be about $26,000 a year. If I went through the government, um, not going through the government was $1,600 a year. So you can... You can understand which, which decision I went with real quick, but that doesn't help their program. It doesn't help their funding because their mechanisms and tools are so out of, out of date and out of place. So we're looking forward to uh, seeing how this uh, plays out and may have to push on this bill a little later, but right now they're still working on the details of it. So hoping that risk, risk rating 2.0 for flood insurance does come forward and still keeps moving again one of those behind the scene things that's kind of being done on a actual bipartisan basis. So I know you don't typically hear that, but that is one of the things going forward. Um, the other one we're really trying to watch, and we talked about this a little bit at mid-year, is CFPB rules are coming out and they're focusing on a, a tighter restrictions on background checks. And that's part of why I had uh, Dave Pickron with Rent Perfect come up and speak a little bit. This is some of their initial, they're, they're, I think of the salvos being fired over, but from a more practical perspective, what they are is saying, hey, we're concerned about these kind of issues. And so with that in mind, we're going to be tracking some of that. And as they get to a point where there's actual changes in either behavior or best management practices, we're going to be getting those out to you, but I want to give you a heads up that CFPB is looking at, you know, background checks and how they should be done. And so we expect to have some updates forthright, forthcoming as soon as they give us something more than we have concerns. Okay, what are they? Um, and we'd rather have concerns and have it discussed rather than drag somebody into court and sue them. So that's what we're trying to get through as well. So those are the main issues right now, kind of the updates on things. Um, again, this is an election year. Log jams are going to be the name of the game. Nobody wants to get anything done unless they get full credit for it. It doesn't work real well. And again, like I said, Mansion just blew up in other things, so more power to him, I guess, at this point. Um, but that's kind of it for legislative. I think there was a question on there about risk. Let me... So th this will be risk rating 2.0, which is basically saying flood insurance will be done in a different way. They're going to upgrade their risk process so that the current process, which pretty much hammers everyone, will be reformulated. And in case you don't know, the um, 
flood insurance program is about $20 billion, $20 billion in the hole. And so their formula automatically tries to recapture some of that $20 billion. That's why their rates are so high, which means they nobody wants to participate, nobody wants to do it. So you know, nobody else, fewer and fewer people participate in the program unless they absolutely have to, which doesn't help fund the program. With a good insurance program, they need to have broad you know, participation and support. So we'll see where this goes. Um, but that's where they're trying to get a risk rating 2.0 redeveloped. And frankly, they're going to have to bail out the flood insurance program to get it on a, a good firm, firm foot, foothold. So, but you're very welcome. And let's, uh, with that, I'm going to move us over to bring in Mark here. And Mark, um, flooring training. I love the phrase there that we're going to have flooring training. Um, those of you know, at, you know, at National Rio, we don't just, we're not just association, you know, workers or um, little busy bees. We actually have a lot of our own properties and do stuff ourselves. And, and George, I have a, just bought a, a nursing home. We're renovating it to about 64 units. And one of the first discussion points we had was, the partners was, what flooring are we going to put in? Yeah. So very timely. I was very pleased to hear you're coming on. And I know from across the country, we have people on here who are very interested in hearing about different flooring and details and information on it. So with that, Mark Barnsworth, please take it from here. Well, thank you. And thanks, Lori, for the opportunity. Um, I did reach out to Lori and she was gracious enough to get me involved here today. So I really appreciate this opportunity. The reason I wrote this manual was I have been, I was born into the flooring industry. My father owned a very, very successful floor covering store. And as a family store, you are taught everything. I was taught at seven years old to measure carpet. And believe it or not, that's the opportunity time because my father taught us with craft paper. He would take a, a sheet of paper and make it 14 foot wide and give us a red sheet of paper and say, now your carpet is 12 foot wide. I don't want you to waste a lot of carpet. I want you to figure out how you're gonna cover that. And by doing that exercise, it taught us to measure. In today's market, everyone's relying on computers and lasers. You can always go to your local hardware store and buy a, a measuring tape and measure correctly. Now, one of the things that I do wanna teach you in here, I'm gonna hold up a copy of my manual so you see it. I, it took me almost three years to sit and write this manual. I have, like I say, I'm, I'm in uh, my uh, early 60s, and the best writers are the people that have actually experienced what we go through, everything that we have possibly went through in the industry. I can't tell you how many times I have heard, why don't you write a book? Why don't you write a book? Well, that's what I did. I wrote a book. So let's start out with, number one, a floor will never fail. I don't care what you say, my Canton Courthouse is marble. That floor will never, ever fail. But the minute you put the wrong material down, that floor is going to fail. I guarantee you the material fails, not the floor. So in saying that, when I first said that to the professors at Ohio State University and I showed them, I said, with a manual like this, you can look in here and determine how the product is actually manufactured, what it's actually made out of, whether it's going to be truly a waterproof product or a not waterproof product, just by the substance that they make the product out of. Now, let's start from the beginning. As a professional sales floor sales rep, when you entered my store, I looked at you just like I entered a car lot to buy a car. I asked you a lot of questions. How, how long are you gonna keep the car? Where are you gonna plan on using the car? I'm really trying to find out not really your budget, but what is your real needs? Because of the fact I could sell you a product that will get you into your budget, but if that product does not work, then why even buy the product, all righty? 
So I'm just going to touch on a few pages that are very, very important in this manual. And when I talk about this manual, I price this manual extremely competitive. This manual is $50 that's delivered to your, your location. That's freight everything. This manual also includes 14 training videos that you would have access to. So if you have any questions about the certain chapters or things like that, there's a, a video before you get to that chapter that's going to tell you the key parts of the chapter that you'll be reading. And what I do is I, these 14 videos, there's 14 chapters, so there's a video of every chapter coming up, and it's going to tell you the important part of that chapter. So to back up a little bit, chapter one will introduce you to the product, talk about conditions, talk about if you have direct sunlight coming in from a certain area, you cannot use wood because it will fade the product. I, I will talk about moisture levels in carpet one, things of this name in chapter one, I'm sorry. Chapter two is gonna give you a complete guide. So when you start a job or if you try to figure out how to measure, the answers are right here. A lot of my customers will use this as a quick reference. Actually, I did one of your events and a roofer actually purchased my book because it says here a 14 by 19 is 320 square feet. So he actually purchased that book for that roofing, all righty? The second part I think is much more what you're gonna be interested in. That's actual product knowledge, all righty? This is actually a picture of a waterproof floor. Now, when I do these, on a seminar type situation, it's easier because I can actually put the product in your hand and let you click it. But it's very easy. I do, a, I do these all over the United States for the floor covering business. If you're a brand new sales rep, they hire me in the industry to teach you our industry, all righty? So I start here and every one of you have probably dealt with a male and female where you click the two products together, all righty? Now, when you, by law, it has to tell you the different gauges of the product. I'm going to just reach down here a second and steal a cheat sheet sample that makes it very, very simple to talk about. The first thing they're talking about is the mill layer. The mill layer you can see is actually the top of your waterproof product. If you remember, well, at least some of you might, when I was little, I would take a glass and I would put it on grandma's table and then grandma would hand me some polish and a rag and say, get that ring out of there because your cup just ringed my table, all righty? And today they do not do that anymore because they have a real thin product called acrylic, which is this product right here. This acrylic can be made in any thickness you desire. That is when you go to Home Depot, one of your box stores or one of your local retailers, and it's gonna say on the box, it's either gonna be a seven mil, an eight mil, a 12 mil, a 20 mil, or a 30 mil. What they're talking about there is this right here. This is what they're talking about when they talk about that, all righty? Obviously, a 30 mil is a complete overkill. A 30 mil is a complete uh, acrylic thickness for an airport or something of that nature. But yet again, a seven mil is a complete understatement. A seven and eight mil will actually mark scratch and cause more problems than if you would just spend a little extra money and buy the 12 mil top. I tell every one of my clients, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I ran five retail chains. I had two outlets and I did sell the seven mil product for that customer that absolutely insisted on it. And I said, well, if you're planning on selling your home in the next year, it would be enough efficiency to at least sell that house and get out. 
if that's your intentions. But I said, for a few dollars more, and a lot of times it's only a hundred or two hundred dollars, I can put you into a 12 mil product. It's going to give you a five year commercial warranty as well as a lifetime residential warranty. And whether it's in an apartment or in a home, it still carries that lifetime residential five year commercial warranty because they know the top of this product. The worst thing that's ever going to happen to this acrylic is you may mar it, but you can mar your end table or anything. These products have a lot of sugar, household sugar in them that hardens like cotton candy that gives it its hardness. The sugar is what you're actually embracing here. You can take one of those uh, rags that they use for nice cars and they, they just wipes right up. Every one of my installers, everybody carries them. I can't remember the name of the rag, but it just is a real nice finished rag and it'll just take that sugar right off. You never see the mark. You are not destroying your product with those scratches. If you notice your Walmarts, department stores, they buff the floor at night because what they're doing in, in the dress shop with the LVT is they're actually taking the little mars off the sugar or the little scratches. They just dissipate away. It did not hurt the product. It no effect at all. Your biggest issue is gapping of floors. When you click a male and female together, all righty, you have to hear it click. If you do not, with your ear, hear that engagement, that product is not the installer's fault. It's not the homeowner's fault. It's the fault of the product itself. I want you to look very closely here. If you can see it, see this little engage right here? That is the most important part. A lot of you deal with wood tongue and groove, and you know the thicker that you make that tongue and groove, the thicker it's going to go in and engage, all righty? That is called engagement. By law, on the side of every single box, I don't care who manufactures it, we get manufacturing from Vietnam, we get it from South Korea, we get China, we get the USA, it doesn't matter on the side of the box, they must put the true engagement, what we call click gauge, which is do not buy anything 3.5 or under, all righty? The one that we purchased for my own house is a 5.5. It's a 12 mil, but it's a 5.5 engage system made by Quickstep out of Canada. But it has a very deep channel. So when you put it in deeply and click it, it's going to look more like real wood than if you just click it together on top. That's why when I watch HVTV or something of that nature, I tell my wife, that's horrible. See that real flat look? That is an inexpensive laminate that they tried to dress this beautiful home up and they should have just spent a little bit more because the one thing that a consumer sees if you're flipping a home, we always see the paint, the trim and the flooring. That's what sells most floors. You can hide a lot with carpet. You can hide a lot of imperfections. And when you're flipping a home, carpet is absolutely the least expensive way to get by in any flipped home. And I do want to break some bubbles here. A lot of people think that the waterproof LVT products are the best for allergies and things of that nature. They're absolutely the worst. If you notice your Marriott, your hotels, they will use the LVT products when you enter a room, a lobby, they'll use them in hallways, but a lot of the bedrooms are still carpeted. That is because in, when you have particles floating in the air, they continue to float in the air. When you put carpet on the floor, they will attach to that carpet and alleviate a lot of the allergies and things like that, and you can remove them. That's a myth that this is best for 
allergies. It's the worst for allergies. People think it would be the best because of the way you can clean it and things like that. That's gonna lead me to the next problem. When I was at the convention in Cincinnati, a lot of the investors came up to me and said, we're having problems because of the fact our cleaning people do not know what to use to clean the products, all righty? And when I come back with this, I tell them the number one cleaner you can use is Dawn Disc Soap. The number one cleaner is Dawn Disc Soap. The reason is it already has acrylic on it. It is deliberately beveled to a very fine bevel that if we put the, the product in someplace that has a lot of sand, like Arizona or Texas or something of that nature, if it wasn't beveled, your, pedal, your, your uh, sand would grind the face right off every product we ever manufactured. So it has a natural tendency to go down to the bevel because we create it that way and it's easily wiped out and swept out. Here's what happens. Going back to my picture here, a lot of people have to understand, and the reason I spend so much time on waterproof product is that seems to be what everybody wants right now. It's a product, yes, you can do it yourself. There's no need to pay people to put it down. It's extremely easy. And I'm gonna show you a page to get your right trims and transitions that will save you so much time. But right now we're talking about this and we're talking about steam cleaning. That's the number one reason a floor fails is you steam clean your LVT floor. Now think about why. In this example, I have my acrylic, which is here. I have my paper, which is actually plastic. When they use a laminate product, it is actually craft paper. Craft paper will not expand or contract. This is actually vinyl paper. So when they first started making LVTs, they would take your top, your vinyl paper, and then they didn't have this little netting right here. See this little netting? This was just brought out three years ago. This little netting is what they call their rigid core. What happened was when you would apply steam to it, whether it be sunlight, whether it be hot steam, without this little rigid core, these two products was applied to any secondary backing that they want to apply to. This happens to be rubber. The reason I use this is I can bend it and so on. If I use something like this, I couldn't show you how it bends and how it's made. That's why I utilize this sample. But just think of this sample as being a real solid piece of wood or laminate or something of that nature. What would happen was, Without this, these two were mirrored together. They was applied like this. These two would expand and contract because this is vinyl. It's not paper. It will expand and contract. So I'm gonna show you how they make it. What we do is we take this and what we do is we actually apply the bottom, which is your top, that you see right here, we apply these two together with heat, all righty? But we'll apply more heat to it to bring it all the way out to the edge to make it fit. If you apply heat to it with a steamer in the kitchen, you're going to make it come out even farther. You're telling it it didn't come out far enough. You're telling it it needs a stretch. Even the rigid core can't stop it completely from because the rigid core is right to its edge. So what's happening is you're actually making this grow is what you're doing. What will happen is you will walk into a kitchen and it may be six months or eight months and you're going to hear eat, eat, eat. What's happened was your vinyl has expanded from the heat and caused that to happen. Or 
Second situation is you will walk into a kitchen and you will see it separate. And it might have a very, very fine separation in it. The reason that happens is it never truly engaged. Now, here's what I tell people. Go to your local box store. Go to Ollie's. Go to your local retailers. I had an opportunity. I had five stores. They called me on November 27th. It was two days after Thanksgiving. And they said, we had a cancellation of four semi-loads of Stainmaster 12 mil LVT that I could have bought as a retailer for a dollar a yard. I sat with the owner of my company and he said, Mark, it's Christmas coming up. He said, we're walking right into ice into Ohio. I don't want to invest the $100,000 the very, I turned it down. It wasn't two days later. I see big lots. Stainmaster LVT for $249. They sold it as fast as it came in. So the opportunities are out there. The opportunities to make great buys are out there. Shop for them. Shop your box store. Shop your Home Depots. They're there. Just know what you're buying. That's what I tell people. When you shop, know why you're looking for a 12 mil product and you're looking for a engaged product that is a minimum of 3.5. Now, at our carpet store, if you special ordered anything from our samples, nothing was on our floor that wasn't a 4.5 or better in a sample format because of the fact we knew that was going to be your personal home. And we did not want your neighbors coming in there telling us what a poor job we did or we might have sold you the wrong product. If I'm flipping a home, I'm shopping and I'm buying and I'm buying something at 3.5. And the other thing that I emphasize over and over and over, even though I have a beautiful chart in this book, always buy more than you need. The reason is I have 300 colors I could show you. This color here, this brown right here, this color, the same color is made in China that's made in Japan, I mean in South Korea, so on. But there's a difference in their machines. If that machine is a tenth of an inch off with this engaged system, if I get a piece from South Korea, it will not engage in a piece of Vietnam. The top will look exactly the same. The color will look exactly the same. The only thing you can do at that point in time is try to glue it or glue it to the floor because it is not going to go together. When we get a, a sale in any flooring store I've ever worked at, trained at, or talked to, they always tell the customer, you're going to have extra. They allow for the little cuts, things like that. They tell the customer, just put the boxes. The truth of the matter is, they're covering their butt. In case of the fact something does go wrong, they know that it has to be completed. So even at our store, we would have odds and end sales that was just enough maybe to do a bathroom or a foyer but we always had two or three boxes left over, it seemed like, from every job. Now, what we did was we always gave the opportunity for the consumer to keep them or we would buy them back. A lot of times, we, would, we stocked a lot of product. We were able to work with customers, but you are not. You're buying for your own home. You're buying for something that's your property. Don't think you can buy half of it, and then go get half of it later, do the rest of the house. That never works. I'll tell you right now, it never works. It will work in carpet because of the way carpet's got to be manufactured, which we'll touch on in a bit here, but it will never work in an LVT or a laminate product. Laminate products are the same way. Their engaged system is made by their specific machines. So, so Mark, if I can interrupt you real quick. Yes, I was going to take a break. So perfect. I'll give you a second to breathe. 
Um, the question is, especially for us, some of us will be putting them in our own homes. I gave you an example of the nursing home we're converting over to multifamily. Um, a lot of us do single family rentals. Is there a, you know, a grade level that we should be looking at in terms of, because I, I've had renters, I'm amazed at how they can damage a floor. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So is there a grade I should be looking at and say, okay, if four and a half is the minimum I should have for my, my own home, is that what I should be looking at for rental or should I be looking at something even tougher or because I want something that's going to be strong. I don't have to replace it, but I also can't break my budget on it. So how do I, how do I balance that? Okay. That's a, thank you for that question. You do not need anything tougher than a 4.5. Okay, you will see 5.5, 7.5s. You're just paying for beauty at that point in time. All righty. Let me tell you why there's a big difference in thicknesses as well. All righty. Let's go back and touch on that. In the home, in the big box stores, you don't see retailers carrying anything, any retail store that has to put their personal name on or see you at a grocery store, a retailer will not sell you anything less than a 3.5. So as a flip your home situation or a rental situation, 3.5 with a 12 mil face is exactly what you can buy. You should pay somewhere in today's market, 229 a square foot, the very max, $299 for that product. All righty. Now, $229 means you bought it, you bought a lot of it at one time, and the retailer is willing to work with you and give you a discount on that because of the volume you might be doing with them. But at that point in time, anytime I get into any type of nursing home situation or anything of that nature, we refuse to use a Plick product, all righty? They make the exact same product, exact same color, but in a blue down situation. The reason is, now a lot of my renters and a lot of my property owners, I left the retail store three years ago because I wrote this book and I decided to go a different direction in my life. But a lot of my renters, that I dealt with, eventually I converted them all to glue down products, 100%. Uh, a glue down product, it, it is more time consuming because of the fact the initial prep work, remember, it's going to take the shape of the old floor. Sometimes it's less expensive to put down a click product because the old floor is so bad, you would have so much repair to it. But usually in a nursing home situation, and I'm talking an older building that you could purchase or whatever, 99% of the time, we can get a machine, take up the old 20 ounce carpet that they put down in all the hallways and things like that, remove it, clean it, and you're good to go on a glue down product. It is not a big issue. There's not a lot of imperfections that you really have to worry about. An installer will come in, he'll get some, um, uh, what's it called, Durafast or something of that nature. You just go to your local hardware, go to Home Depot, just get the crack filler. You guys know what to use. And if not, it's referenced in my book. I got basic insulation in my book for our decks and different fillers and things like that. We all have our preference, how they mix up. But the fact of the matter is, you can level 99% of your floors yourself. The problem that I have is, we always have a major problem with people wanting to put a floating floor in a basement or in a garage situation where it has a drain that slopes. It will never, ever work. The only way you can do that is, you have to cover that drain completely or plug it or seal it off because you're leaving an air gap. Every time you step on it, you think it's only affected it here. No, it affects the whole floor when you step on a floor. I've seen, when you're in a, the business and you, you deal with consumers and do-it-yourselfers 
It's like walking in a house and saying, oh, I seen you did your own drywall. You recognize things and you go, I know what happened, but I have to be diplomatic and tell you why that happened in advance. Did that answer your question? That does. And Mark, I'm actually having dinner with a friend of mine who did exactly that. <laughs> we're up in the basement with that. So I appreciate it. Sorry, I interrupted you to go on under the carpet. No, no, no. That's why I always say, if you purchase my manual, call me. There's a big difference between somebody trying to lose weight on their own and somebody trying to get a personal trainer. A five-minute phone call, a personal trainer can say, quit eating cake, you know, and we could go on. So that's just, you know, that's just the way I look at it. I always look at personal training as the way to go. Now, perfect. in my book, do you have any questions before I move on to transitions? Uh, we, we go ahead and go to the transitions, and I'm going to ask you some questions about some commercial grade and 12 by 12s and squares like that. So, but go Excellent. Ahead. Excellent. This is so important. The transition. Everybody has to have a transition. If you do not put a transition down, number one, if you have carpet the floors, the cleaners are going to discolor the edge of your carpet every time because they're going to mop this floor or your renters are going to mop this floor or wipe, spill something on the floor. It's got to go right over and discolor that carpet or shred that carpet or start to break down that carpet yarn. A little transition is all you need. Why would you run around to the, you go into a box store and they say, what transition are you here to get? Well, I don't know. <laughs> well, you should be having a book like this and say, here's my situation. I need a square nose transition because what a Finnish carpenter cause, cause, I mean, states as a transition is not the same name that we use in the flooring business. We are very unique for some reason with our terminology. What you might call something we call completely different and what you're calling it, we'll send it out to the job site, and it's not what you even needed. So that's why I say transitions are so important, that you get the right tr transition the first time, put it down the first time, it will fit, and it will work. That is a briefing on transitions, but it's very, very important that when you buy product, the transition is the right transition from carpet Carpet to floor, all righty, or whatever you're going through. Now, I would like to hear some questions about what you have on your mind because I can answer those questions and I can show you more charts on based on what you asked me. So, so along those lines, let me let me mention this one, and we, we use this example. We use this in a um, what do you call that? A, a common area. Mm -hmm. where we had some old carpet that, quite frankly, would get worn down very quickly. And what we did was we had some commercial grade, I think they were actually a little larger than 12 by 12, but there were some squares. And it was a variety of patterns. It was kind of like leftover remnants. We yes. went through and put those in. Huge response from the residents. They loved it. And we had, you know, 25 extra so that if something got destroyed, we could replace it. And that was kind of our learning as we go process. And I'm wondering your thoughts on something like that, some do's and don'ts or cautions. I personally love it. <laughs> I think it's a great do, all righty? What you're talking about in the market today is more carpet towels and carpet squares and things of that nature, all righty? What I love about these products they already have what we call an open cell padding on it, all righty? It's already made with 100% pop bottle carpet, all righty? Now, let me explain where I'm going to go from here. First thing is I want to stop you. In a common area, when I would go to a nursing home, anywhere where somebody entered that common area, I always tried to sell them some type of rubber flooring. Whether you went and you bought the exercise squares or you bought it in a four foot roll piece, all righty? 
The reason is the rubber is slip resistant year round. So you're dealing with elderly people that might be having difficulties, things like that, entering from, I'm talking Ohio, entering from the ice into the building. So it gives you a real nice grip. Number two, rubber is absolutely 100% stain proof. You cannot stain a tire. No matter how hard you try, you're not going to stain a tire. Second thing, and most important is, our rubber floors are not made of car tires, whether you want to listen to that or not. In the United States, they might be if you buy them from Farm and Fleet, which gets their rubber from China. But in the United States, we are only allowed to recycle a truck tire, okay? Not a car tire. The reason is a truck tire is much more denser in its rubber, all righty, number one. Number two, it does not off-gas like a open cell product could, you know, an open cell product means it's open and it's gonna off-gas. And when you close up a exercise room and you go to Florida for six months, you come back and open that door, that off-gas can make you mighty sick. So the EPA is very, very strict about how we produce our rubber and where it's produced. The, one of the largest rubber plants of recycled rubber happens to be in Findlay, Ohio, not more than an hour and a half from my home. So yes, I have sold rubber. I have visited the rubber plant. My history is that I used to travel the United States and I worked for a company called Floor Covering uh, Weekly. In our industry, in every industry, you have your industry magazine. Our industry magazine is Floor Covering Weekly. I did work for the magazine, so I had the opportunity to go watch these products get made, which is why I wrote the book, because I was able to visualize what's actually happening. I'm going to give you a real brief history now on carpet and commercial carpet and things of this nature, all righty? In today's market, the number one thing that concerns everyone is pets and staining. The number one concern that concerns the United States is recycling. That's our number one goal at every carpet mill. That's why, number one, yes, carpet was developed in Dalton, Georgia. Yes, it was developed from the cotton plants in Dalton, Georgia. E.R. Barwick actually to two cotton machines that was making rugs, glued them together, and was able to make a 12-foot loom carpet. The carpet was actually developed for caskets. That's the truth. A casket is actually 12 foot. It's two foot on the sides and eight foot in the middle. The carpet was loomed together with two rugs for a casket and they realized they were on to something. That turned our carpet business into what it is today. But being that we're in Dalton, Georgia, <laughs> that's just a little history lesson, but it is the truth. That's a history lesson, but that's, uh, everybody take away, that's your trivia lesson for the day. That's, <laughs> that's something you can win some money at the bar somewhere. So here's where we're at. So what happened was the carpet industry had to adapt to the recycling product. We made a lot of product of a product called polyester. Back when I was younger, we did a lot of nylon, which was a man-made chemical that we made shirts and clothing and everything out of. But the minute that we would go to school and spill anything on our clothes, it instantly stained because all yarn was white. All nylon was made white. Then what they did was they took a vat dye, which was a boiling tub of water acid of dye with mixed chemicals that would make your purples and reds just like you tie dyed a shirt, all righty? The problem is with tie dyeing, you can also spill hot coffee on that carpet and it instantly discolors. Now, <clears throat> in today's market, they have still manufactured nylon. Nylon is still the dominant yarn in the industry, but it's produced in a solution form nylon today instead of a vet dyed or a space dyed. What that means is think of a radish. A radish is white you color the outside with red. 
That's your old nylons. Today, the nylons are made as chemicals. So the chemical is actually pre-dyed in the red color. It comes out as a red color through a shower head. But now when you slice the product, it's like a carrot. So it's colored all the way through. When you see the mixed colors, what they're doing is they're doing just like a barber pole. They have machines running, but they're twisting colors together that will give you that effect of two tones and things of that nature. Now, what they do with that is they now spin that on a great big spool, like a sewing machine spool, all righty? That spool shoots it through different needles, like a sewing machine, tough to machine going up and down. The cheesecloth, which I've already showed you, is Rigicore. So think about this, but being a lot small, smaller. They run the yarn through, they run it back through. They run the yarn through, they run it back through. In turn, you get what Charles just mentioned, which is a commercial grade carpet, which is a level lid carpet, which looks like this carpet right here. All righty. That is barber pulled. In other words, these two colors are twisted together. And then it is barber pulled and it's ran. You can see the yarns going this way because it is ran as a sewing machine. Your number one nightmare of a product of that nature, of course, is a dog because your dog is going to pull those yarns like this right here. So that's why when you're in a rental situation, the, the tighter you can get that material. See how this is a big loop Berber? The tighter you can pull that down, which is a 10th gauge. Think about 10 needles in a one inch square. Tight, I mean, uh, weaving. That product is gonna come in extremely tight, like what you would see at an airport or like what you would see in a nursing home. It doesn't allow the suitcases or the dog or anything really to snag it because it's pulled down so tightly, all righty? Now, that is a nylon product. Yes, they can make that in a polyester, but what you're going to hear is over and over and over, a polyester does not have the performance durability of a nylon yarn, okay? So how did we get into recycling pop bottles? That's a very great story. We already knew how to make solution dyed nylon. We already knew how to melt yarn. We already knew how to color yarn, and we already knew how to take it to its next stage. What we did was we partnered, I think it was about nine years ago, if I'm not mistaken, I was at the very first recycle plant. It might have been 12. Time seems to go a little quicker. But what happened was, <clears throat> and we all jumped back when we first seen a recycled product, we would have trains of bottles, white bottles coming into this uh, facility at Mohawk Carpet Mills, which is one of the largest carpet mills in the United States. I'm sure you guys might have heard the name Mohawk over the time. So what happened was these bottles are coming down this uh, conveyor belt and they have holes for every bottle, the different size holes. The bottle would, would come down, it would spin that white cap off, that would go right back into the train. That was sent on down to be made out of PVC piping or plumbing piping that you see today. We do not use white caps all right, at all. We take the bottle, we then bring the bottle to a great big magnet and this will make you jump. When you see all these needles flying out of that bottle, because if you're a diabetic, they teach you to put the needle in the bottle and screw the cap for safety purposes. We get those needles out. That's where they come from, all righty? It's then acid rinse, so it's a clear plastic bottle. We then shove that bottle into a great big van that chops it into a thousand little crystals and melts the product. The very first thing we have, we have a shower head. 
the very first thing we make is toothbrush, toothbrush bristles. What you're brushing your teeth with is carpet yarn. It is solid plastic all the way through. We start coloring the toothbrushes for children. That's when the light went off. Then they started taking the, the little chops, mixing them together and making carpet yarn, which today is 100% stain proof, 100% pet proof, things of that nature. What they cannot eliminate is any pet urine going from the carpet into the pad. The, it, there's nothing, there's no 100% waterproof pad that's, let's put it this way, yes, it's in my home, it's in anybody's home, but it's expensive, okay? It would not be feasible for a situation in your nature. Mohawk does make one. It's the absolute best, but it is a 100% pet-proof pad. It's lined with a nylon. It's not lined with plastic. Think about it. A parachute is nylon. The reason is if you jumped out of a plane, plastic would hold coming down, but the minute you shot a bullet through it, it collapses. A parachute, you shoot a bullet through it, it interlocks itself, the yarn interlocks itself and it keeps floating down. That's why they make carpet pad for your own home. You wanna buy Mohawk Smart Strand Nylon Pad. For your renters, you wanna buy a good, 7 sixteenths, eight pound pad. There's a lot of truth in the fact, the better the pad, the longer the carpet holds. What I tell people to do is buy the least expensive and it has to say PET on the sample. Buy the least expensive carpet you can buy. It's 100% pet proof. It's gonna hold its color. It's going to do everything that you want it to for rentals and flip homes. Just put a decent pad down so when if they roll a motorcycle in or they do these crazy things to you, the pad has the endurance to take that just like a mattress. So, so Mark, let me ask you a couple of questions. And we're, yes, we're about five o'clock, which is typically we stop after about an hour. But I'm going to ask you three questions and let okay. you figure out which one you want to address how. One of those is on that pad side of things, um, sound abatement. So as one aspect, yes. two, if we can touch on tracks a little bit, you know, the pro con of that. And then the third one is concrete floors, whether it's putting something on it or ceiling or anything along those lines. So again, sound abatement first, and we'll kind of go from there, but. Sound abatement, okay. Sound abatement on all carpet cushion, you're going to get the same sound abatement across the board. You, The only thing a carpet cushion is going to do under a carpet is give it firmness. It's not going to make one pad, whether it's a six pound, eight pound, 10 pound, is not going to make it any quieter at all. When you're talking underlayment now for LVTs, that's a whole different story there, all righty? And I have a whole chart right here, and I want to talk to you about this. In our personal home, here, this chart is on page 123, and it talks about the underlayments right here, all righty? Now, here's what I want to tell you. If you know for a fact that you're going to have a high rise, and it's going to be a problem with sound, you want to go with the very best is cork, okay? Cork is sound deadening. You can put cork under LVT. You can put cork under wood. You can put cork under laminate. It goes under everything, all righty? Now, 99% of the time, it's not feasible for a flip home to use cork because it's too expensive. I would not use it in any of my flip homes unless you knew you were getting a lot of rent like we do in New York 
Our high rises in New York are almost 90% cork, but look how high they are and look at the noise factor that would trickle down, all righty? In our situation here, the number two recommended product is actually rubber. Rubber will absorb the sound. It is the, if I was shopping at a Home Depot or at a local retail store, Just my Depot. picture is in rubber. Excellent. So, all right. Excellent. So what about Trex? Trex what are you talking there? Trex decking? Yeah, more for the decking side. Is that Okay. All of your product, if it says WPC, that's wood plastic composite, that is Trex. That's okay. exactly where the industry came from. So anything that is WPC is 100% Trex. It, uh, the only thing you do not want to use is a laminate because it's sawdust. Let's okay. talk about moisture. That's huge in basements, all righty? Here's what I tell people. 99% of you are missing the boat because you do not buy the 29 cent peel and stick towels. You, you think that they're gonna curl on the edges. They're no good. That's completely, completely wrong. What's happening is your basement or your commode in your bathroom is putting off moisture that is getting under that peel and stick towel, releasing that peel and stick towel. What I tell everybody to do in a basement is seal it, but do not seal the edges. What you're doing is when you seal a basement, you're making it waterproof or even a bathroom, you're making it waterproof, but you cannot make it 100%. You have to leave the edges. It has, to, the moisture has to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. It will go up the sides of all those four walls in that basement and that dehumidifier will draw that moisture off those walls not to let it uh, build up and accumulate. The problem that most of my people are making a mistake with is, and I can't tell you which one, because what I would do is get a moisture reader on it and I would go to somebody that's a professional or somebody that, that you trust in a hardware business. There's Thompson's, there's so many different ones, but just like my business, there's different moisture levels that those are made for. Depend on what your moisture level is, is the one that you want, and then never, ever, ever seal it completely off. You have to leave it uh, come off the sides or what's gonna happen is it's gonna crack your floor. Excellent. Mark, I, I can't thank you enough for your, your information on this. It's, it's absolutely incredible um, sharing your information here again and, and just encourage everyone to go take a look at it, get the book, get, get the videos. Um, Please. One, I one mean, the, the book is the answer. I mean, the book is going to save you thousands and thousands of dollars if you really read it and if you have questions, if you really utilize me and, and a quick phone call. I mean, come on, I can tell you, you're just like a deal with Charles. Ask me the question. I got the answers, I hope. Absolutely. Mark, thank you so much. Um, well, thank you. And thank you, Lori, for having me and the whole group. And I sure appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you guys again. Thank you. That sounds great. All right. Take care, Mark. We'll see you. Everybody thank you, guys. Here. Um, we'll see everybody, see everybody next month here, and we'll go from there. Thank All you. right, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Bye now. Thank you.